Okay, so welcome to this next video uh, on uh, skeletal muscle contraction. So at the moment, we are discussing uh, the structure of a sarcomere. And uh, so far, we've discussed these Z discs, which are going to line up uh, in lines within the muscle fibre to form myofibrils. Okay, now we're discussing what's actually going to contract between, contract them and bring them closer together, because at the moment, all we've got is this line of Z discs, but to achieve muscle contraction, what needs to happen is that these Z-discs need to be brought closer together, and that's going to overall contract the entire cell, basically. Right, so, the thing that sits in between neighbouring Z-discs, like so, is basically a disc of protein which has then got myosin filaments um, um, attached to it, going in either direction. So, in pink, what I'm going to draw is the myosin filaments. So, these are myosin filaments, so they are polymers of myosin, basically. Okay, so, uh, you'll have a fibrous portion here, and then off the side of this, of course, you'll have loads of little myosin heads, so it will look kind of spiky. Okay, so that's the structure of a myosin filament, and these myosin filaments are attached to this disc of protein here. So these are myosin filaments. Right, okay, so... This entire structure now, from one Z-disc to the next Z-disc, this entire structure here, this is now known as a sarcomere. So this is a sarcomere. And this is the contractile unit of muscle, basically. What will happen when we stimulate this muscle to contract is that this myosin filament will pull this Z-disc in this direction, so it'll pull it, this Z-disc, towards the centre of this central disc attaching all the myosin filaments. Uh, so it will pull this Z-disc in this direction, and it will pull this Z-disc over here in this direction. So it will move the two Z-discs closer together. Okay, and it will do that by the myosin heads climbing up these actin filaments. And I should also uh, no, I should also point out that the myosin filaments, these heads are sort of, you know, the the myosin filaments are polarized, if you like. The myosin, if we look at the structure of a single myosin protein again, it has one direction, which is this uh, myosin, uh, this tail, this fibrous tail, and it, and then polar head is pointing in another direction. So when you create a myosin filament, what you end up with is the polar heads like so, uh, with and they're pointing in a direction basically. And when you have a myosin filament like this, these myosin filaments in here will be oriented like this, but these myosin filaments pointing the opposite direction, they'll be oriented like this. So the myosin uh, monomers will polymerize instead like this to create a myosin filament which is oriented in the opposite direction, if you like. So these two myosin filaments are uh, oriented in the opposite direction so that uh, this myosin filament can climb up these actin filaments and pull this Z disc in this direction, and these myosin filaments can climb up these actin filaments and pull this Z disc in this direction, and that's how you achieve uh, contraction, basically. So really, when I was saying that a myofibril was a chain of Z discs all aligned, really what it is, is it's a chain of sarcomeres, it's a chain of Z discs connected by these uh, myosin filaments in between, and they're all aligned together basically, and that is what a myofibril is, so it's a chain uh, of sarcomeres, which are all going to contract and then Obviously, the final sarcomeres will be attached to the cell membrane over here and the cell membrane over here, and they'll pull the ends of the uh, myof myofibril, muscle fibre, to inwards, and that's how you achieve contraction. Okay, but we will look at all the molecular details of this. Okay, so that's the structure of a myofiber and the myofibrils within it. So now what we need to do is we need to look at how we actually excite a uh, myofiber to contract. So, uh, this means going uh, and looking at nerves. So let's draw another picture of our muscle fiber and then let's draw a nerve uh, synapsing onto it. Okay, so here's our myofiber. Right, there it is on this side. Here's our myofiber. So this is our myofiber and damn it, I have, haven't drawn a T-tubule. Okay, um, so uh, well, we'll start off with this. Um, 
but uh, this will do for now. Right, okay, so um, what we need is a neuron synapsing onto this myofiber. So here I will draw our axon terminal, which is synapsing onto this myofiber. And it's a little bit out of scale. Uh, the, neuro the axon terminal will be tiny, absolutely tiny compared to this myofiber. But so that the picture uh, looks nice, that there is our axon terminal. Okay, so this connection between an axon terminal and a myofiber has a name which you will hear all the time. So I need to go over that name. So this junction between a membrane of a muscle fiber and an axon terminal is known as a neuromuscular junction. So it's a junction between neurons and muscles. So it makes sense, neuromuscular junction. And people will often abbreviate it to NMJ. So if you ever hear people talking about NMJs, what they mean is neuromuscular junctions. They mean axon terminals synapsing onto the membranes of myofibers. Right, okay, now what does this um, axon terminal release? Which neurotransmitter does it release? Well, it releases the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. So I'll draw a little uh, blob to represent acetylcholine being released. In fact, we'll probably need multiple blobs. So I'll, we'll, we'll put in multiple blobs. So that those pink blobs denote acetylcholine acetylcholine. So neurons which synapse with muscles always, absolutely always, um, well at least in skeletal muscles, neurons which uh, synapse with skeletal muscles release acetylcholine. That is how they stimulate skeletal muscles to contract. So this axon terminal is going to release acetylcholine. So I think it would be quite nice to look at the structure of acetylcholine because it's a very simple molecular structure. So, uh, what's the structure of acetylcholine then? So, the structure of acetylcholine is that you have an acetyl group, clearly, because it's, that's its name. So, here is the acetyl group. It's basically ethanoic acid. So, here's the acetyl group. And now it's bound to choline. And choline, it's linked to choline by an ester bond. So, choline is an alcohol, basically. It has an alcohol group on it. And the alcohol group here has esterified with the acetic acid um, group of acetyl. So, you've got acetyl bonded to this choline, and that's the ester. So, then choline's, the rest of choline structure is that you have two carbons, like so. And then the interesting part of the structure is that you then have a nitrogen here, which is bonded to three methyl groups, like so. And that means that nitrogen has one more bond than it should have, and that gives it a positive charge, basically. So, this is the structure of acetylcholine. Right, so acetylcholine is being released by this axon terminal, and um, it's going to diffuse across the synaptic cleft, which is this space between the presynaptic membrane and this postsynaptic membrane. Uh, and I should also say that the, um, the cell membrane of a skeletal muscle cell is often referred to as the sarcolemma. Okay, so you will see that terminology used a lot, and if you ever hear a sarcolemma, all it means is the cell membrane of a skeletal muscle cell. Now, in the postsynaptic membrane, or in the sarcolemma, there are receptors for acetylcholine, and these receptors are of the nicotinic acetylcholine type. So, I will draw in a little receptor for acetylcholine here. So here is a receptor for acetylcholine, and basically it's a ligand-gated ion channel. So here we have our ligand-gated ion channel. And the acetylcholine receptor is actually an example of a receptor that doesn't just bind the ligand once. It actually has two binding sites for the ligand. So this is often known as the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. So basically, this receptor has two extracellular binding domains for this molecule acetylcholine. And to activate the receptor, uh, what you have to do is two acetylcholine molecules have to bind to this uh, extracellular domain, one in each of these two binding sites. So nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. Okay, right. So, when acetylcholine is released by the axon terminal of this neuromuscular junction, acetylcholine is going to diffuse across the synaptic cleft. It's going to bind to this uh, to the uh, binding domains on this nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, and 
Two of them will bind to each nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, and that will cause the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor to open. And I should also mention that nicotinic acetylcholine receptors are often denoted like so. N for nicotinic, ACH for acetyl, and then CH for choline, and then R for receptor, so NACHR. You often see that used. Right, so when these nicotinic acetylcholine receptors open, they conduct monovalent cations. They conduct sodium ions and they conduct potassium ions. So, sodium is very, very high extracellularly, and I feel like I need more space. So I'm going to redraw this picture out here. So, here is the sarcolemma. Here is our nicotinic acetylcholine receptor here. We've now got two acetylcholine molecules bound, which I would just denote as pink blobs here. And that has caused the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor to open. That's a nicer picture, a bigger picture. Okay, so here is our nicotinic acetylcholine receptor here, which is, was denoted in green. Okay, right. So uh, when this nicotinic acetylcholine receptor opens, it's per it is permeable to monovalent cations, it's permeable to sodium ions, and it's permeable to potassium ions. So, sodium concentration is very high extracellularly and low intracellularly. Potassium concentration is very high intracellularly and very low extracellularly. You also have to factor in the fact that the resting membrane potential across skeletal muscle cells is usually around negative 85 millivolts, which means that if you move from the extracellular compartment to the intracellular compartment, the electrical potential goes down by 85 millivolts. So if you have a little man in the extracellular compartment who measures the electrical potential there, so here's a little man measuring electrical potential, he'll get some answer. If he then moves into the intracellular compartment and measures electrical potential in here, he'll get another answer. Basically, what he's going to ask then is how much different is the intracellular electrical potential from the extracellular electrical potential. And that is what is meant by the voltage across the membrane. So the voltage from extracellular to intracellular is the electrical potential measured by the little man inside minus the electrical potential that he measures outside in the extracellular environment. Okay, and basically this one is smaller than this one by 85 millivolts. Okay, so that's why the electrical potential difference is negative 85 millivolts. Right, okay, so what's going to happen is that even though this channel is permeable to both sodium and potassium, you are going to get a net movement of positive charge into the cell, and this is why. Potassium will move out of the cell it, because the concentration of potassium inside is so much bigger than the concentration of potassium outside that the probability of a potassium ion hitting this channel from the intracellular aspect and just happening to go through is much bigger than the probability of a potassium ion hitting from the extracellular side and going in. And even though the electrical potential is around negative 85 millivolts, that isn't high enough, basically, to stop a net movement of potassium out. It will decrease the probability that a potassium ion will move, uh, but it won't stop it. Now, sodium has a much higher concentration outside than inside, so the concentration gradient is driving sodium in, and the electrical gradient is also driving sodium in, because sodium has a positive charge, so it wants to go to areas of lower electrical potential. The intracellular compartment has a lower electrical potential than the extracellular compartment by uh, 85 millivolts, so sodium's driving force in is very good, and basically the movement of sodium in is much, much higher than the movement of potassium out, and it's mainly because of this uh, electrical potential which is basically trying to pull the potassium back. It might just be failing, but, you know, it's going to reduce the current of potassium out uh, to much smaller values than uh, the current of sodium in. So you overall get a net movement of positive charge in, i.e. the movement of sodium ions in is greater than the movement of potassium ions out. So you get a positive charge coming in to the cell, and we'll continue this discussion in the next video.